Um, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for, for joining us on our first uh, seminar uh, today on climate change and health. Um, Today we have a really a collection of three talks, really interesting talks, and the session we're go is going to be shared by Massimo Stafagia, and he's going to be introducing speakers later on. I'm just here to welcome you and to give you a bit of a view of who we are and what is this about um, uh, today. So basically, we are the IC Europe, the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, and we represent the European chapter. Um, we are we're, um, a group of researchers, uh, international researchers on environmental epidemiology, and we uh, bring together the community uh, across the world. We organize conferences, as you can see in the images, but we also organize educational programs, and uh, this is part of one of uh, these trainings, uh, this series of seminars. Um, as you might have uh, come across this seminar through our website, um, any other uh, seminars will be uploaded there. So please keep an eye on them as well. Um, you can find more information about the research we do, who we are and other events on our website. So please um, keep checking that. Um, we're also on Twitter where you might have seen our advertising as well. Um, and we tend to post every, every event that we host uh, in there. Um, memberships are also open. Um, so if you are interested, um, please do have a look, there, there are uh, discounts for students. So um, um, it's, uh, yeah, just have a look. It, it does provide a lot of uh, benefits, um, especially as a res uh, an early career researcher. Um, so um, yeah, just have a look at our website. You'll find all, all the information. Um, and it's not only limited to people from Europe. Uh, the IC has different chapters across the world. So there's the uh, North American chapter, the African chapter, the Asian chapter, the South Africa, the South American uh, chapter. So wherever you are, um, you will find uh, your smaller community uh, uh, of researchers. Um, one said that, as I mentioned before, this is part of a series of uh, three webinars or seminars. Um, we haven't arranged yet a specific date for those, but you can see them on the screen. Then the next one will be uh, focus on new methods and study designs around climate change and health epidemiological studies. Uh, we're hoping to host it in October, 2021. And the third one and final one of this series of seminars will be on new communication tools because we acknowledge that uh, scientific communication is a really important and key aspect of scientific research. Um, and we've seen this in, in situations like the pandemic uh, with, with uh, um, COVID-19. Um, and so we're going to be hosting that in November 2021. The specific dates uh, will be clear closer to the date. And you can, uh, as I said, just check our website or um, our Twitter and you'll find all the information. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, your microphone should be automatically off, uh, but please uh, keep an eye that they don't turn on. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please do put them in the chat function, which you should be able to see with this icon that I mark here with a circle. And Massimo will, will keep an eye on the chat and make sure that all the questions are addressed by the speakers. Um, and just final, a final note is that this event is going to be recorded and hopefully posted on our website so people that were not able to attend uh, will be able to see it. So um, please keep your, uh, if you don't want your, um, video to be on, please keep it off. Um, yes, and that's it. Um, that's that's it from me. So Massimo, it's all yours. Um. Okay, thank you very much, Aina. And uh, good afternoon to everybody, of course. And uh, I would like to thank very much the organizers because I think this is a very interesting uh, session. Uh, we have three renowned scientists and the title of the session is New Data Sources and Application in the Climate Change and Health Topic. And you can see here the program. So very briefly, we will have three presentations for each one of it. Of it. There will be 20 to 12 minutes of presentation and, and I will select uh, the main, let's say, uh, questions for two, three minutes, questions and answers right afterward, each one of them. And at the end of it, we will have 10 minutes of uh, overall discussion. And we'll also the speakers will have the chance to make questions to each other. And uh, we can uh, you know, to solve the remaining issues on the, on the topic. 
Uh, okay, so the first presenter will be uh, Claudia Di Napoli. Uh, she will be she will give a very interesting talk uh, on uh, 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 from the title "Bridging the Gap: How Climate Reanalysis Can Advance Environmental Epidemiology." She is a postdoctoral research fellow uh, at the University of uh, of Reading, and so the stage is yours. We are very curious to know how to bridge this gap. Well, thank you very much, Massimo. Um, for the nice presentation. So we're, I'm going to share my screen, just tell me if everything works as it should, hopefully. Okay, let's do this. Is this working? Yay, thank yes, you. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, good afternoon, everybody, also from my side. And it is a real pleasure to be with you today. So yes, as Massimo just said, in the next 12 minutes or so, I will be talking about the climate reanalysis data sets. And specifically, I will first explain what they are. I will then present ERA5 as an example for this type of data. And finally, I will illustrate a couple of examples where climate analysis can be used in environmental epidemiology. Okay, so starting from the basics. When assessing uh, exposure to the outdoor environment, epidemi epidemiological studies have historically relied on weather stations. And there is a good reason for that. Weather stations measure and read the observation of parameters such as air temperature, usually with great accuracy and frequency. But as this map show here on the right, there are, these stations are not evenly distributed across the globe. Some gaps are present, especially in the most remote areas um, in, uh, in, in our world. Not only, weather stations are often located in city airports. And as such, the environment that they monitor is not exactly in the environment where people live in. And last but not least, weather stations rely on instruments and sometimes on humans too to operate. So if there is any kind of disruptions, that daily record keeping gets disrupted too. And so you can end up with the gaps in the historical time series of your observations. So how can we solve these problems? Well, climate analysis can really be a useful tool from this point of view. Because as I show here, observations from, from weather stations are not the only observation that we have. We also get data from aircrafts, from weather ships, from weather balloons, from satellites, and many other sources. So it's really a wealth of very useful information you know, to give you like a, a number, we ingest something about like 95 billion observations every day. Observation data is very much location and area specific. So what does a climate analysis do? Well, it combines, it blends all this information into a climate model and also the laws of physics underpinning it. And by doing so, it fills up the gap we see we saw in adjusting the previous slide in the previous in the previous maps and it creates a picture of the past weather that is a complete and consistent body in space and in time and a picture that consists of a grid so an evenly spaced matrix where each grid cell that you can see here on the globe of the right has the value of the parameter of the environmental parameter of interest so as I mentioned to you before, I want to talk to you about RFI, which is one example of a climate analysis data set. Specifically, it's the latest climate analysis produced by ECMWF, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. RFI provides hourly data on, um, on many parameters such as air temperature and humidity and many others regarding the atmosphere and the land surface. 
There are also um, parameters or products that, as I call here, they are derived, so they are generated from, from ERA-5. They are themselves, okay, Kramery analysis, and then they also provide, usually they're made to provide some historical features for environmental conditions that are potentially detrimental for health. And I will show a couple of, of examples of derived products to you just later on. Another important characteristic is that at each time step, um, HERA-5 provides um, data on the regular latitude and long longitude grids, and where each grid cell has a side of 0 0.25 0 .25 degrees, which is roughly 31 kilometers. So where can you find um, the HERA-5 climate analysis? Well, HERA-5 is completely available for the there from the climate, uh, climate, climate data store. And the currently spans from uh, 1979 to present, so for more than 40 years of hourly data, and soon will be extended from 1950, so even more data. And every it gets updated um, every day. And basically, the latest available data are the ones from five days ago. So, for example, today is the 22nd of June. The last available data are from the 17th of June. And I think this is pretty cool, especially, for example, if you are interested on some extreme hazards like, I don't know, heat, stra heat waves or cold spells, and you want immediately to dig in into the environmental exposure data associated to those. Okay, here I show the landing page for the set I use the most in my research, and I mainly work on, on heat streams. So the parameters are the parameters I look I look for are general temperature, humidity, wind, and radiation. And as you can see, you have these four these four tabs. The, which basically help you navigate the data set to get extra information and download the data, the data set themselves. And specifically with the download, for example, you can select one or a selection of years, months, days, and also times. And also the geographical area you are interested in. So there is no need to download the full global data set. You just can just zoom in on the area you are interested in. And to download the, um, the data, you have to, um, to be registered. In fact, on the, on the top right um, of the screenshot, you can see I'm logged in uh, with my account. And this is completely free, OK? It's completely free to everybody. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. OK, as I said before, there are also what I call the derived reanalysis products. And he, here you can see the landing pages for two reanalysis data sets that have been generated from ERA-5. So the provides historical data from 1979 to, um, to present for wildfire danger. And instead of the one on the right, which is also known as ERA-5 heat, provides historical data of outdoor thermal stress indices, such as, such as the UTCI, for the same time period. OK, so now enough you know, with the listing of all, all <laughs> the climate reanalysis data sets available, let's now move to applications. So um, how can climate reanalysis data sets can be used in epidemiology and public health? Well, the first example I'd like to show to you comes from um, the Lancet Countdown Tracking Progress on Health and Climate Change, which is an initiative I am part of. And in working group one, as you can see here, which basically um, focuses on health impacts of climate change, we track these health impacts via a set of indicators. As, as I can show you here on the, on the right, there are a different in the, uh, five of these indicators are indeed based on the um, on the era five data sets. And as an anticipation to you, um, in the upcoming 2021 Alaska Canada report, even more indicators okay will be based on on era five. Okay, so a few examples, okay, with regards to these Lancet countdown indicators. Um, well, the, which one for this one, for example, on the left. Um, in the 2020 report, ERA has used ERA-5 temperature data to track how the number of days 
of exposure to heat waves has changed from 1980 to 2019 and for people older than 65 years. Uh, another indicator, which is here on the right, instead uses the wildfire data set I just showed you um, a couple of slides uh, before. Um, exactly uses that to determine how the number of days of exposure to very high or extremely high risk wildfire, wildfire uh, danger has changed over time. And you can explore more about these indicators, the era five data um, uh, behind it, at, the, at this website that I posted it and which is basically where you have the, the data platform uh, of the Lancet countdown report. Okay, another example I'd like to show to you is about the suitability of uh, climate analysis data for uh, um, health related studies. So in this uh, paper, that my colleagues and I published just last month, we demonstrated, we tried to demonstrate this suitability for the ERA-5 uh, uh, heat uh, derived products I showed you before, and specifically per, for the uh, Universal Time and Climate Index, okay, which is, if you are not familiar with it, is basically represents the human uh, physiological response to the thermal environment with the latter embodied not only by temperature, but also humidity and wind and radiation. And we did our study across uh, 25 cities, as you can see on the map on the right, and these are in, located in the nine different um, European countries with data spanning from 1990 to 2015. Okay, so what is it that we did exactly? Well, first we compared the analysis based UTCI with the UTCI calculated for, uh, from weather station observations. And we did also the same with the temperature that we used as a reference thermal metric. And what we found uh, the most important, uh, one of the, the first finding was that there was a strong correlation between the real, real analysis and station data. Um, as a second thing, uh, and it's more regarded the epidemiological assessment, we use a distributed lag nonlinear model to investigate the exposure response relationship between the daily mortality and the UTCI for the 21 cities I showed you before. And we did also the same for the, for the temperature. And we basically noticed the very minor differences between exposure response curves modeled for the analysis and the corresponding one uh, modeled for, um, from, uh, um, from station data. And interestingly though, we, um, we noticed some differences in the relative, relative risk and basically, specifically here, so it's, it's a difference that can be observed in the, in the tail for cold streams for southern European cities. And this is mainly due of the role of, of wind that is used in the calculation on the, on the, of the UTCI definition. So to conclude some take home messages, uh, well, climate analysis first provide a gaps-free picture of the past weather uh, may represent a valuable alternative to weather stations. Um, the analysis data set such as ERA, ERA 5 and derived products are making their way more and more through environmental epidemiological research. And then mo the most important thing is that climate scientists, climate data sets, and, I, and I'm talking about that in, as, as a climate scientist, climate data sets are not only for climate scientists, okay? So are there also to be used in all the applications that you might be interested in? So epidemiological applications are indeed also in this uh, in, here included. So, you know, go download them and really do cool, so, some cool research, okay, with them. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudia. That was very, very useful, very interesting. So, uh, first of all, I would invite the, the audience to post your questions in the chat box, so you have time to do so. You, we have time for to discuss this, I'm sure, during your work, during your uh, uh, daily work, you, you will have had opportunities to work with this data and you might 
want to make questions to Claudia and then to Rochelle and Brooke later on. So I will start uh, with the two questions that are now on, uh, on the chat. I have questions by myself. Uh, first of all, from Aina, she asks, what are your thoughts about downscaling reanalysis data using high resolution spatial topographic data or even ground stations data? Is it a good approach? How can we make sure that data is correct? Is comparison to ground monitors a good checkpoint? Yes, if you can just give an overview on this. Of course, Massimo. Uh, thank you, Aina, for your question. Um, I think downscale reanalysis data is a totally le legit, you know, methodology to approach. Okay, so especially because it really depends in the end of what point of view you know you want to to take in a, in a, in your research. If you want to take more something more global, so maybe from that point of view, you know, it's also okay to have a coarser spatial resolution. But if you're looking at something that is more especially detailed. Okay, I think downscaling, you know, it's something to go for. And yeah, data is correct. I would say, yeah, always, you know, comparison with, uh, with weather station data with ground monitors is indeed, you know, a really good station, you know, starting point. I would always suggest, you know, to do that check just in case to make sure that Either they put it at a, either you know the analysis data you're using as they are, or you're done scaling are actually giving what we're expecting. Thank you very much. Some other questions are popping up now. So there are some questions. I think we will go back there later on differences between different products. Sometimes it is easy to get lost in this abundance of different products. Specifically from Aina, what is the difference between ERA5 and ERA5 land? And also there is another question. Can you please explain a little more on ERA5 heat? Yes. So the difference between ERA5 and ERA5 land, I will say first of all, is in the resolution. So the spatial resolution, so ERA5 is, um, is 31 kilometers, as I was saying. And I think ERA5 land is nine kilometers. I don't want to say something wrong, but you know, this is as far as I remember. And I think there might be also some differences in, in what these, you know, before I was saying that to build up your analysis, you have to make use of the weather model. Okay, that's underneath it. And so weather models consist of different layers, different tiles, okay, as, as we call them. And these tiles are basically how the weather sees Earth. Okay, so the topography, you know, the presence or not presence of cities and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's also the difference, you know, that, that really worth to, um, to take into consideration. And about a little more about era five heat, yes. So basically era five heat is basically equivalent or era five, just in the sense that um, it provides historical data uh, for the globe uh, for uh, two, so far two um, thermal stress indices. One is the UTCI, as I said, the other one is the mean radial temperature. And it's basically made by taking era five parameters as inputs Okay, and it calculates from those these two thermal stress indices I was telling you about. So it's basically a shortcut to say instead of making you making the calculations, okay, we just provide you the indices as they are. So you can just use them straight away. Thank you very much, Claudia. So I will keep the, the other questions for the discussion later on. So I, I think we can move to the to the next presenter. You can stop sharing your screen. Thank you. So the next presentation will be quite on a similar topic. It will be uh, on exploring Copernicus services and satellite data for environmental health applications. It is from Rochelle Schneider. She was a, a doctoral student at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She is now a postdoctoral research fellow at the European Space Agency. Please, Rochelle. Thanks, Massimo. So first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation to talk about this exciting topic and more exciting when we link to with satellite data. So um, today I'm going to talk about the most of, uh, from data from the European Union's Earth Observation Program, which is called Copernicus, which is provided uh, some products that Claudia explained very well, but also direct satellite data. 
So basically, what is my uh, research area is linking all these environmental data with the health outcomes. But not only health records, but uh, institutes that are working with the environmental epidemiology and in institu inst institutes that are concerned about our health and want to improve the decision making using this type of information. So in this case, we have, for example, uh, within this uh, Copernicus program, we have some data that is measured directly from satellites, which is, for example, is the land monitoring service. And here I bring to you three examples of, of what are the products that you can explore as well in your, uh, in your projects. For, for example, the land cover, which is um, European uh, based, but also they provide in a global format of uh, the uh, characteristic uh, of the land over, over 44 classes. And the great of this information is the resolution of, of that, that I will get later on, as you see in the picture on the right. So we also, uh, it, they also provide the imperviousness density, which is basically uh, the areas where we have the natural source, natural uh, surfaces like uh, forest, uh, trees, and uh, the anthropogenic uh, coverage, that is the cities, uh, roads, and these kind of um, human human made uh, uh, areas. And we also have elevation data, which is uh, providing this in a great uh, spatial resolution that as you can see on the image on the right is an example of London in United Kingdom, where you see uh, just a, a piece of the city concentrated in the Hyde Park, which is a famous park in the city. And you see all the buildings, around that specific area. So all these gray uh, elements in the image are the buildings. And this um, blue grid represents uh, one kilometer by one kilometer. So when you see the city overlapped by this one kilometer by one kilometer, we now can go back to the resolution of this data and see that the land cover is provided by 100 meters and the elevation is provided by 25. So this is a huge quality of uh, resolution where, for example, you are dealing with um, a cohort data and you need to analyze the surroundings of, of this, this uh, uh, for example, this individual that you have the health records and see if the, if the environment affects somehow some specific health outcomes. And you see that the, the, the blue uh, grid outside the image shows the, how tiny is this resolution and how detailed this can, can go to, to your analysis. Um, another example that uh, Claudia already highlighted, which is important, and I perhaps can show uh, and answer a bit one of the question is what is the difference of era five and era five land is as Claudia well explained, is the spatial resolution of the data, but also you see the, that the oceans are not covered by era five land in this case. So that's a, a great example of, of these two. And in this, uh, this, I call it this data as a satellite based uh, data, which is a meteorological data and air pollution data. And why is the satellite based data? Because as you can see here, there is a great amount of satellites being used in these models to help the model to better understand the individual characteristic, characteristics of different places. So um, here is a little bit overlap of what Claudia just said. Uh, I, I hear I, I call it 25 kilometers, but I should actually mention 31, which is approximately 25 in this case. So here's an example what uh, what represents this this spatial resolution of this data. So again, remember that my previous slide showed London with the grid cells of one kilometer, which in that slide looks uh, really tight, really big. And uh, here, when we overlap with this uh, data, we see the differences of the spatial resolution. So basically, you might have temperature data in a, a, in a very large grid cell, but if you use ERA5 land, you get a smaller information, meaning that your variability of temperature in this specific, uh, in a specific city might be more heterogeneous. 
And uh, again, uh, as she mentioned, this is a great opportunity for accessing the meteorological data at temperature in a minimum, maximum mean, and the total precipitation and wind speed. But we also have from these uh, services, we also have uh, the um, atmosphere, uh, atmospheric data, which is coming from the pollution, different pollutants that you can get the information from, and also pollen, which is great for asthma studies. And in this case, the resolution changes a bit when we talked about uh, the European coverage and the global coverage. In this case, for Europe is uh, 10 kilometers ish, the resolution of this information, while the global one is 80. And we are able in this case uh, to, uh, to extract information about uh, nitrogen dioxide, PM25, PM10, which are very valuable for uh, environmental health, uh, environmental epidemiological analysis. And the great information from this is that this information is provided at surface level, meaning that we are able to get the human exposure to that specific pollutant. Another information that is also valuable is uh, the Euro European Environment Agency monitoring uh, network which is a great uh, information as well when you're, you have your health records, for example, in uh, you have access to more than one country across Europe, for example, let's say that you have uh, mortality data for France, Germany and Italy, but you need to access the ground monitoring stations from that specific area, but you encounter this problem of the language, one will be probably in a, in a website in French, another in German, and another in Italian. So how do you manage to get access to this data? So through this portal, you're able to access more than 400 monitoring stations uh, about air pollution data across, uh, across the members of the agency. But okay, so uh, Claudia and I, we talked a lot about satellite data, about this, um, climate and atmosphere uh, data services, but uh, we wanted to know more about the applications of this data in a, in a health, in a, in a health uh, project. So here I also bring some examples to you. So there are basically three examples. One example is working together with uh, UNICEF, uh, several offices from UNICEF to understand dengue in Latin America. Another project is about the air pollution, how to reconstruct air pollution in a specific area where you need to link this information with health records and also linking this information from Copernicus outside the European area. So linking this information with uh, health uh, outcomes in a Latin American country. So starting with the Dengue project, this is a great example how we can link this uh, hybrid so these different sources of, uh, of information, satellite, satellite base, to bring uh, more information and to help society. So in this case, the image, uh, the first row on the left, you see the dengue incidence rates uh, by month in the X axis and the, in the Y axis by year and it for four different departments in Peru, in, in the Peru, in the Latin American country. So together with this information, we also bring information from uh, the mean temperature, humidity, and the vegetation index and elevation to better understand, together with machine learning techniques, how to forecast a potential outbreak in the area based on the weather conditions and the dengue behavior in the, in the, in the past. Another example here is, um, we already uh, we heard about it that the uh, some limitations in the in epidemiological studies is the lack of information from the ground monitors. So here is a clear example on the left of uh, the the blue crosses represent people living in different locations, while the monitors in the red dots are specific located sometimes mostly of the times in uh, urban areas. So you see that a lot of people just don't have. Uh, the right measurement of their own exposure to a specific pollutant. And to be able to solve this problem, we combine the information from satellite-based data and also the monitors in machine learning techniques to be able to reconstruct 
uh, daily variations of the human exposure to this specific pollutant uh, for the, the, the past 10 years. And this data, once is ready, is linked with specific addresses of people or if is or specific zones of the person. And if the person moves from one address to another, you are also able to um, track the exposure. So here's just an image to show you how great and how can vary the information that can be used from these sources to be able to reconstruct the, the exposure, the human exposure. And uh, last but not least is the, uh, this project is, a, is combining this information from Copernicus, linking this information with a variety of health outcomes that is available in countries that is outside Europe. So here's an example of a collaboration with an uh, uh, Institute of Health in Brazil called Phil Cruz, where we are linking all the infectious diseases database, such as Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya, with this environmental information, but also with the uh, cohorts and the health services in the country. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, Rochelle. This is very, very interesting. Congratulations for the broad spectrum of uh, applications you are, uh, you are using uh, in, in your work. Very, very interesting. So I can pick up a couple of questions from the, from the chat. First of all, again, on uh, ELA5, uh, what is the coverage of ELA5 in remote places, underdeveloped countries? Is it restricted mainly to major cities here in these places? This, this coverage is global, so uh, that's the beauty of this product. So if you don't have much weather monitors in the specific area, you can try to explore this uh, type of data set. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Another question, I'm pretty sure you are the right person to ask this question, is about desert dust. Uh, so the question for you, what is the best satellite data for historical PM levels that are directly attributable to desert dust, especially in situations like the Saharan uh, area, the Arabian Peninsula, etc.? Any <laughs> advice? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Uh, well, first of all, the, uh, the satellites, they do not measure PM directly they measure the aerosol optical depth, for example, which, in, which is basically is uh, you have the aerosol concentration in the atmosphere in different, uh, let's say, uh, diameters. And this is the information that the satellite covers for the whole atmosphere. So when this information is inserted in this type of models, which are models that uh, is a 4D model, where well, the model is able to, with, together with uh, mathematical um, equations, to extract the information in different levels is where you are able to extract PM. And in terms of the dust data is exactly, is this disentangle what is dust inside PM is where you, is great to explore the combination of the satellites first to detect a storm or an episode of dust and then combine this information with the reanalysis data. Okay, thank you. Final question for you, which is related to the previous one about the ERA-5. So the coverage is uh, global, but maybe the, valid the validity of the, the, of the estimates might differ according to areas. So the question is, uh, do you know any validation of data from ERA-5 land for regions outside the UAE, UA, like Brazil, uh, for example? Sure. Yeah, great question. Yes, we have a uh, we, the, 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 the Copernicus uh, um, Climate Change Services also provides the uncertainty of, the, of these uh, products. So if you go to the website and there is an area that, that you can select this information inside of when you download the data, you can download the data per se, or you can also download the uncertainty for the area that you are interested. So in, indeed, there are some areas with the accuracy is really high compared to the others because of the quantity of the information that the model also can get inside in terms of observations. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Rochelle. So I think you can stop. Okay, you just already stopped sharing. And so we move to the, yes, to the third presentation. It is on a different topic, slightly different topic, very interesting. 
It will be about an exposure data package for US-based tropical cyclone epidemiology. The talk will be from Professor Brooke Anderson from the Colorado State University. Please. Thank you very much, Massimo. Um, I'm thrilled to have been invited to come and talk some about this today. And it is on a different, slightly different topic, but I think we'll see there's some very similar scenes to the uh, uh, themes to the first two talks. So I look forward to the discussion as well. I just wanted to start as a, with a reminder of what tropical cyclones are, because I know it's not an exposure that everyone might be familiar with, particularly in a European audience where there are less hits from this. So these are very large cyclonic storms that form in the tropics, and they can bring extreme exposures from things like flooding and, and severe winds. They happen in areas around the world, but the name for them tends to vary by where they happen. So the different areas where they form are called basins. In the United States, the areas that can affect us, these are often referred to as hurricanes for the most severe of the storms. There are also lower level ones like tropical storms and tropical depressions. In other areas of the world, you might hear these referred to as typhoons or cyclones. And in all of these basins, there's a season when these tend to happen. So in the United States, most of them happen between June in November. We developed an exposure data set for looking at these, for doing epidemiology on them. And I'm going to talk some about that. But again, I wanted to make this a little bit more general. I think that it's really a useful research product to be able to share exposure data sets. And I think we've seen that through the two previous talks, how powerful those data sets that they were talking about were. So in addition to talking about the data set, I want to talk about some of the goals that we had in, in developing this, because I think once you start sharing a data set, you have to think about, well, how do I do that in the most useful way? So one of our goals here was to incorporate different measures of different hazards that come with these storms. Um, mixtures research is gaining a lot of ground. In the talks by Rochelle and Claudia, you saw that those are providing access to different hazards. Um, so here I want to talk about that in the context of tropical cyclones and how we included that in this data set. Second, it's really important to make things useful for epidemiology to create things that align and can integrate easily with the health data. In this case, that meant making these exposure assessments at the county level. So I'll talk some about that. And finally, a goal of this was to share the data in a way that's easy to use efficiently and reproducibly. And that's part of what led us to share it as an R package. So I'll finish by talking just a bit about that. I'm going to move through this kind of quickly. I hope that some people are interested in this specific data set. So I've got links to two things to go to if you want to learn more about them. I put these in the chat as well. The first is a paper we put out in Environmental Health Perspectives last fall. This describes the data set, how we created it, and how we validated it against some other types of data. And then second, we have an online tutorial that describes the software itself, the R package. So this includes instructions for how to get this on your computer once you have R installed. And then once you have it, it has examples of code to use to, to explore that. I'll give some examples in the talk too, but if you wanna try it out more, please go there. All right, so I'm gonna start by talking about that first goal that we wanted to capture these different hazards of the storm. So these again are massive storm systems and they bring a lot of different things that could potentially cause harm to human health. This is an example of something that was put out in advance of the severe storm that hit North Carolina in 2018, Hurricane Florence. And you can see they're giving threat levels for a number of different hazards. These includes, include storm surge, which is flooding near the coast. Also inland flooding, which can happen when the extreme rainfall overwhelms rivers and streams. And then also damaging winds and tornadoes. We tried to capture a number of these through the exposure data set. And by including them all in, it allows people to look at not just the individual hazards, but mixtures of them. And also it provides a similar framework for looking at these different hazards. So this is an example for Hurricane Ivan. It came in following this red track that you can see right here and had an interesting track in that it went back out to sea and then looped around and hit again. Um, the first metric here that we included is a distance-based one. This is just the distance from the storm track. Now, this is a proxy for exposure. It's not the best measure of exposure, certainly, but a number of previous epidemiological studies have used this proxy. So we included it to make it easier if somebody wants to compare their results to an earlier study that maybe used this proxy. All the rest are based on specific hazards. You can see we've got rain, wind, flood, and tornadoes. 
And what's interesting about this is the pattern spatially of where it's causing an exposure is very different. So a lot of the wind related exposure is happening near the coast in this storm, and this is pretty typical. Whereas rain and flooding can happen well inland and tornadoes can as well, but in a different spatial area often. So for some of these metrics, you can see here, these are all binary and exposed or unexposed, but some of them are included in the data set originally as a continuous metric where you can pick different thresholds if you want a binary exposure. And that includes the, the rain and the wind. Our second goal was is to make sure that this data set was easy to integrate with health data sets. There's excellent um, meteorological data that's relevant to tropical cyclones. But a challenge that I found as my research group was starting to work on the health effects of tropical cyclones was that it can be difficult to align them with the, the, the way that we have our health data. So a lot of data on human impacts, including health, are aggregated based on geopolitical boundaries. This is an example showing power outages during Hurricane Irma in 2017. And you can see that this, this metric of human impact, it's given at the county level. By contrast, um, there are different spatial scales for a lot of the meteorological data we have to work with. Um, the two talks before, especially Claudia's talk, really talked a lot about reanalysis data, which is what we use for our precipitation, original precipitation data source in this. That's given in a gridded way. Others are given for ground-based monitors. In that case, you have a spatial point location. When you start comparing that to counties, you might have some counties that don't have any weather monitors, and then some counties that have multiple ones. So part of our goal in developing this data set was to take the available data and work with atmospheric scientists to try to get county level exposure assessments so it would easily line up with time series of daily counts of health outcomes at the county level. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about how we did that with some of our exposures. So first, I'm going to talk about wind. And in this case, we actually used an atmospheric science model of winds during tropical cyclones to model out the wind field and then use that at the county level. So this is giving an example from several storms. Each of them show the storm track. And our first step was to model to the county centers what the wind speed, the maximum wind speed over the course of the storm was. So this is giving a local estimate of the intensity of that storm, taking the values that are given by the National Hurricane Center of central estimates of the storm as a whole. From that, we were able to apply a threshold and say that, that different locations are exposed versus unexposed. And this example is actually showing this for a study that we did of over 100 counties um, for looking at the hospitalization risk associated with tropical cyclones. For some of the other data, rather than fitting a, a model, like the wind model that we used, we instead paired up with observational data. So for example, for the rainfall, we used a reanalysis product. But to be able to do that, these storms take a while to kind of track through. So we needed to identify the date the storm was closest to each location. This is showing an example for Hurricane Floyd that hit in 1999. And you can see we went through and were able to identify the date that it was closest to each county in the eastern part of the United States. And that varied a lot. So some of the ones in, um, in Florida, it was closest on September 15th, whereas some of the ones up in New England, it wasn't until several days later that the storm was closest there. Once we had these dates, we could integrate them in with that reanalysis data and draw out the appropriate window for each range. So you can see again dates up here. And in this case, the lag zero, the color counties, are the counties where the storm was closest on that specific day. So you can see that's changing as you go down the rows. And then we were able to pull a window so we could get the rainfall, not just on the day of the storm, but these are massive systems. So often there's a lot of rain before and after. So we were able to get different windows around the storm. Once we did this, we created this data set and we're sharing it through R. So you can pull it all, you can download it all through R, but we included not just the data set itself, but also some functions to make it a little bit easier to work with it, which was part of the appeal of sharing this as an R package. So this is an example of a code call you can use to map the county level continuous exposure for a certain metric um, for a specific storm. So this is looking at Ike in 2008 and asking for wind. And you can see that creates a map of that wind field, this maximum sustained winds for each county. You can pull out data sets similar to this as well that give those values for the storm. 
also with epidemiology, a lot of times we don't want to look at just a single event. So that can be interesting as a case study, but it's really helpful to look and see what kinds of associations exist over multiple exposures over multiple years in multiple locations. Sometimes we will only have data for a certain set of locations, but then we want to see all of the exposures for those over a certain period. So we included functions to do that. This is an example. In this case, you can do a single or a set of counties, and this is using a five digit code that the US has that's unique for every county. You can put in a threshold where it will pull out every exposure where the wind was over that threshold. You can do something similar for rain and then give your range of years. You can see then that this pulls out all of the storms where there was an exposure locally in that county that met that criteria. It also gives information like the continuous measurement of the maximum sustained wind during that storm. And then also the closest date and time in the local time. And this helps you again, pair it up with a time series of health data. So I wanna finish with the last goal. And that was that we wanted to make sure that this data was easy to use efficiently and reproducibly. So there are a number of pathways we can take, we could have taken for that. We chose to do our packages and those happen to hit a lot of these goals. So the first was that the data access is scripted. That means that instead of going somewhere and pointing and clicking and getting your data set and having it, you've written down a recipe for getting it. And that means that in a year or in a couple of years, you can go back and you can reproduce that. You can do the same process either to recreate the results that you did or to, uh, to adapt it to work on a different study. Second, the data set is versioned. Because this is a package, each time we modify it, it gets a new version number. That's something that can go into the method section when you use this data. And as we continue to update the data and try to improve the data set, the old versions will continue to exist. So you can always go back and find the version that was used for a specific study. Third, the data can be easily integrated with the whole universe of tools that exist for working with R. Um, these include mapping tools, and we leverage some of those to be able to, um, to, to create the maps and do some of the other pieces within the package itself. But it also means that you can use all of these other packages that exist on R very easily in conjunction with the data. That includes cutting edge statistical tools like the distributed lag nonlinear model package DLNM, which um, we saw some plots from that, I believe, in Rochelle's talk. So some of the tools like that, it's in a good space to work with immediately. And finally, and this is not unique to it being an R package, but the data creation we documented and made reproducible by posting it all through GitHub. So all of the data here is either coming from processing existing public data sets to get to that county level aggregation or from open source tools like the, the, um, the wind model that we used. So the whole process of creating this data set is something that we put up on GitHub. That means that even though we only have this available for the United States right now, if somebody was working on cyclones in India and, and was interested in doing something similar there, we've got all of our algorithms and processes for how we went from things like reanalysis data sets to these measures of exposure. So this, uh, this tool is being used already for some research, which I'm very excited about. Some of it has come out of my research group and then some of it is, is starting to come from a variety of different groups. Some of the projects are looking at preterm births, hospitalizations among older adults, broad cost mortality, and then also risk of death for those who are on dialysis. So I'll finish there and I would be happy to take any questions and I'm looking forward to the discussion with Claudia and Michelle. Thank you very much, Brooke. That was very, very interesting. And indeed, uh, you're right. It was very much related also to the previous talks in terms of the kind <laughs> of use you can make of products to, yeah, to monitor these events. I, don't, I, I didn't find any, any questions specifically to, to this talk in the, in the audience. I can make a couple, uh, even though it is not my area of expertise. So these might be trivial things. First of all, uh, I was wondering, uh, I understand the scientific part, let's say the research part, but I guess this kind of data, these activities it must be also very much of interest for local authorities willing to monitor these events to you know, mitigate the effects in the population. So what kind of uh, links do you have with the local uh, uh, authorities? 
Um, so far, we haven't done much with local authorities, but one of my collaborators has uh, some close connections with the National Hurricane Center, and that's been really interesting to talk about these ideas of how we might take epidemiological research and use it to help inform what risk we might see. I think one area that'll be really interesting is as we have kind of these more consistent ways to assess exposure over lots and lots of storms and lots of years and lots of locations, that leads uh, leaves open a path to doing kind of health impact assessments under different scenarios. And that could be scenarios of climate change. We expect some of the characteristics of these storms to change with that. But even there's some work that we're starting to do across our work, uh, across our, our lab group, that's looking just at different kind of like phases, like phases of El Nino and things like that, and how you might have expectations of different levels of health impacts. Um, in, in these periods when you've got a lot of activity versus periods where you've got lower activity. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's, there is a question now, I can read it. When you develop such a huge package and data set, how do you make sure that they, that data is continuously fed to the model so that you provide accurate and up-to-date data? Yes, that's a great question. Right now, how we've done that is after a season, we'll go back and do a reanalysis. And I'm a couple of seasons back now because we're trying to get our, our wind model faster. But we do it kind of in a chunk where we'll update and do a new version of the data package. Um, but there are data sets even larger than this where whole teams are working on them. And I think those are more similar to some of the data sets that were covered in the earlier talks. And one of the things I'm really excited about for those in terms of providing scripted access to something that's being continually updated is that there is a way now to create what are called APIs for accessing data, not just through a website that you go to, but that website-based data can also be accessed from the code. And what that means is that a lot of people have started making R packages and Python packages where you can type in a script and it will pull the latest data from a NOAA weather station or um, the latest data from the US Census, for example. So those are letting the data sit on the, the organization's website, but providing a way that you can write code to get it rather than just going and kind of pointing and clicking. And I think that's a really exciting path forward. It's certainly, it's very different from when I did my dissertation and I spent a lot of time downloading data by hand. Thank you very much, wonderful. Okay, I think we can now move to the general discussion. I, I, I guess we have more or less 10, uh, 10 minutes. So yes, I invite the three speakers to switch on the camera. If, if you agree, I would uh, I would uh, have it like this. First of all, if you have questions to make one each one 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 other one another, you can you can have this opportunity. If you have a curiosity in the activities of the others, I think it's a good chance to to make questions. And then I will go in the real discussion, which I would try to keep it on the epidemiological perspective, which because I think it is much more in line with the, with the audience. So first of all, questions from you? No questions. Okay, okay, but you have the chance at least. Okay, so there were some questions which uh, were made in the audience, uh, which also were in, in line with the, what uh, I had in mind when I was speak when I was listening, especially Claudia and Rochelle. I was thinking about uh, the perception that most of the times these products, EVA five temperature, air pollutants from camps, etc., they are extremely valuable uh, in terms of for, to design uh, short term effect studies because you have a very fine uh, temporal resolution data, daily, but even uh, three hour, even hourly data. Sometimes it is difficult to match this resolution with the health outcomes data. So perfect to that. And also, in fact, in the application from Claudia, she was comparing uh, ERA5 uh, with, uh, uh, with temperature for the, uh, for the long term, for the short term effects. The question is, if you can imagine applications of this data for long term effect studies, what kind of uh, application would you think? Or if you have experience in using this data to estimate the long term effects of, uh, I don't know, uh, air pollution, uh, etc. Any insights on this? Uh, oh, I, yeah, <laughs> is, 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 if, you know, Masi will talk about air pollution. Maybe you want to say something yes, about maybe. that. Sure, no problem. I can start. So uh, that's uh, we have a uh, we have the satellites uh, orbiting around us for 
many decades. That's, that's the one of the beauties of that makes possible to also reconstruct the, the history uh, the, in uh, in our like the past of of our lives because we unfortunately we don't have the same amount of uh, um, air, air pollution monitoring stations as we have now in 10 years or 20 years ago so the opportunity to have the combination of the satellite data with these models that are able to reconstruct i think this would be the greatest wo uh, word for us in terms of exposure to reconstruct what was the, uh, the, our exposure in that specific time, in that specific level of the atmosphere uh, for a long track of records. And uh, I think for long-term long studies, that is the, the interesting part because you don't have, using these, uh, let's say, reanalysis data, you don't have missings. You, you have this data available in different areas. And you also have this at human level. And if it, you have an amazing health record, where you have the address of the person moving every uh, every month or moving daily, like you're working in one place, and but you have your residential address in another place, you are still able to track this level of pollution. But of course, as any kind of data set, you need to read the instructions and understand how this data was created and what are the limitations of that specific data. Because as the monitors, the satellite and the reanalysis data also have their own limitations on that topic. Okay, Th thank you very much. Yes, I think this is, this is true, of course. And this goes to another question I was having, I was thinking while you were speaking, sometimes people is quite scared of this massive amount of data, also the complexity behind this data. So for example, Brooke made a good point. So she presented a package and say, okay, this, this is the package, you can read the tutorial and uh, we can provide the, this data, these estimates in, in the package. And that's a good way to, to make people, non-expert users, let's say, Became, become conf confident with those kind of data. Do you have any, uh, Rochelle or Claudia or even Brooke, any tips for how to process this amount of data? Do you know of, uh, I don't know, our packages to, 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 to go into the Copernicus or CAMPS or ETA5 and download and process the data or uh, having a very strong expertise in Python and R is the only way to, to process this data. No, Claudia, no. please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everything can be learned in life, right? Right. This is what usually people say. And um, I mean, I think this is also the case, you know, for climate reanalysis data. Um, you know, going back to the example of the climate data store, store from Copernicus. There, for example, you can uh, use Python. For example, if you are an, uh, if you if it's a language you are familiar with, you know, to download your data. So, for example, crop them to the geographical area you are interested, in and you know, or select the years you are interested in. But yeah, you don't need to be an expert because um, we already provide sort of chunk of code. Okay, so with examples there. You, so can, you can just copy and paste, you know, and play around with them. And it's just a matter, you know, to get him familiar with it a little bit. And then, uh, you know, also more often in these kind of services, reanalysis services, you have also, you know, teams that are happy to, you know, answer any questions that you have. So for example, in, in the Copernicus Climate Data, so you just write, to the, um, to the, I think it's called uh, end users, I think as assistance team. And, you know, just in a couple of hours to just send you, you know, even the piece of code you are, you need to get the data that you want. So really there are, you know, even if you're an expert, there are people, there are people that are really willing to help you. If I may add as well, uh, sure. this, um, this whole data set is, is a, there is a lot of, uh, as Claudia said, uh, they are creating, they, they are making this easier for everyone to use, not, not make this a boundary, a limitation. So they are creating R packages, Python packages, they having their own toolbox that people don't actually need to download the data, but make the query and download just the piece that they want. If they don't want to download hourly data, you can ask, uh, ask for monthly or daily, so you save the space of your computer. 
And they also provide this in Google Earth Engine where you can download this in CSV file. So you just need to create a script for that. So they are, they are making this as available as possible for everyone to, to explore it. Especially for those that maybe might not have, as you were saying, Rochelle, a bigger computer capacity, because all <laughs> these, you know, all these operations, they are not, they are not done in your local machine. Okay, they're done in the supercomputers, you know, uh, out there, whatever they are, it can be a NOAA, it can be a CNWF. So they do the job for you and what you get is just the end result of it. Okay, thank you very much. And another subtle question, this is more on the exposure, or the, let's say epidemiological part about exposure measurement error. This was made by Anna in the chat, but I think it is very key for our purposes. So in epidemiology, a key challenge is that different exposures often have different resolutions. Those different exposure errors, which affects our, your health estimations in unpredictable ways. Any thoughts on statistical methods that can deal with those multiple mutant challenges? Any I, I can insights? Talk a, Brooke? I yes. can talk a little bit about it from the perspective in terms of the potential for measurement error for some of the stuff that we're doing. Sure. So I mentioned that we measure the winds and we use the model for that. And that of course isn't perfect. It does well for kind of classic looking storms, but sometimes you get storms that are a little misbehaved and it doesn't do quite as well for that. So um, it's something that we thought was very useful because you can apply it not only to historical storms to get that, but also to scenarios of future storms. So it gives you a really nice path for moving into health impact assessment that could play a role in policy. Um, but one of the things that we did that I think is a very simple solution to that, it's certainly not fancy, is to have another measurement of that and do a sensitivity analysis. Do you see huge differences when you're using something else? So there's this nice product that the National Hurricane Center puts out each year where they go through and at each point that the storm's tracked, they say how far winds of certain speeds went from the center of the storm. And because the storms sometimes aren't symmetrical, usually aren't symmetrical, they do it in different quadrants of the storm. So it's, it's kind of, it's just a categorical variable because you can only say, oh, they were over 64 knots or they were 50 to 64 knots and things like that. But it is something that allows you to do a sensitivity analysis to see if there's an issue with using those modeled wind speeds for your health analysis. So so we pulled those as well and we put them in the package too. So it's pretty straightforward for somebody to take their same code for running their epi model and just shift what they're using for exposure and that to do that kind of sensitivity analysis. So I'll start with that because I think that's the very simple <laughs> way to do that. I'm sure there's some fancier ways too that might be a little bit more nuanced, but. Any ideas from Rochelle or Claudia on this topic? Huh? I think the, 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 the great uh, way to discover these, if these uh, uncertainties between different data sources is actually testing them. So Claudia uh, presented a very good paper on that where they actually tested the, the difference between the weather stations and the year five. I think this is a great example how we can make the make more um, visible what are the trade-offs between one data and another. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree that this kind of validations are key. I would say that in the, in the case of temperature, this makes life easier because we know that the correlation between uh, these model estimates and, uh, and ground observations are much are very high. I guess this is more complicated, for example, with air pollution. And I know there is a lot of interest in applying these uh, products in the air pollution epidemiology field. So I guess that uh, this issue of validation, especially in areas where you don't have much data, and also, yes, the, the issue of exposure measurement error needs to be, in a way, addressed. As Brooke was saying, with the extensive sensitivity analysis, alternative products, etc., because we really need to convince the, let's say, epidemiology, the air pollution epidemiologists, that these products can be very, very uh, valuable for our for our studies. Yeah. I, I have a, actually a follow-up question related to that for Claudia and Rochelle. And again, I really enjoyed your talks. I'm so glad I was invited to be part of this and to hear those talks. Um, so we ended up using a reanalysis data set kind of like, like um, was described in the earlier talks for precipitation because we found that sometimes in very severe storms, that was exactly when the winds knocked out the monitors that we wanted to measure. So exactly where the missing data was. So your point about kind of continuous data was really helpful. But we did use some comparisons when data was available between uh, ground 
based monitors for precipitation and the reanalysis data set. And one thing that we saw for that was it seems like when you get to the very, very, very extreme values, you tend to underestimate a little bit for the reanalysis data set. And, and we figure that that makes a lot of sense because you're using a model and that's gonna kind of pull down to your more typical values. I saw you're doing all this great work on temperature extremes for that. And I've never taken a look at it. Is there some of that same kind of like being drawn down a little bit from the extreme when you're in the, the worst heat waves for reanalysis versus? Uh, yeah, ground. Brooke. Yes, I, I think I bumped into this paper, you know, that was looking exactly at, at, at this point for heat yeah. waves in Europe. And they've exactly figured out this, you know, that actually the analysis don't go that extreme yeah. than uh, more observed based data sets. So this is something that as you, you know, you observed in, observed in a precipitation, but it happens, happens with the temperature as well. So yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you very much. I think we can close the session here. I think we should be on time. Thank you very much to Brooke, Claudia, and Rochelle. This was a really great seminar, great presentations. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Um, as we said, the recording is going to be available on the website, um, and we're going to send an email to all the attendees um, with the slides if they're available, the link to the recording, and uh, a survey for your feedback. So yeah, thank you so much everyone for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.